let's just set up a table of values. So we'll uh, compare the, this one to just x squared. So if we put negative 3 into x squared, we'll get 9. Negative 2 will give us 4. Negative 1 gives us 1, 0, 1, 4, 9, like that. Well, think about how we're getting these numbers. We're just squaring some other number. And that's it. That's all I have. We don't multiply it after that. We don't add anything to it. We just square a number. All right. Well, this is very similar in that way. It just takes a number and squares it. Um, now, it doesn't just take this number and square that. Something happens to it before it gets squared, but we're just squaring numbers. So if we just keep moving up by 1, right, go from negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, like that, we should expect somewhere along the way to, to see the same outputs come out of this function. Right? At some point, you know, in some way, we can cause this to be uh, negative 3. We can cause it to be negative 2. We can cause it to be negative 1. And it would square it, and we'd get those same exact numbers out. Let's see what's happening here. Take negative 3. Negative 3 minus 3 is negative 6. We square 6, we get 36. Okay, so clearly not the same output as negative 3. Right? That gets changed before it gets squared. Negative 2 minus 3, that's negative 5. Negative 5 squared is 25. Negative 1 minus 3, negative 4 squared is 16. Okay, but here, when we get to 0, put 0 in there, 0 minus 3 is negative 3, negative 3 squared is 9. Okay? Not a coincidence, right? We get the same out output uh, when we put negative 3 into this function and when we put 0 into this function. Right? We get the same outputs, just three steps off of each other. This one's three steps behind. Right? We have to move up three steps to find the same output. We put 1 in, 1 minus 2 is negative 2, right? just like this one. 1 minus 2 is negative 2, square that, you get 4, just like that. Right? Negative 3, 9, 0, 9, you get 9, you get 4. Next, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1. 9, 4, 1, we put 3 in there, 3 minus 3 is 0, 0 squared is 0. Keep going, 4, 4 squared to give us 16 there. But 4 minus 3 would give us 1. 1 squared is 1. We get the same exact thing. 9, 4, 1, 0, 1. 9, 4, 1, 0, 1. We're getting the same outputs, but different inputs are giving us those outputs. Like it's just, we can just take this output, group of outputs right here. Just move them, move them ahead three, and now they all match up. They're all the exact same output. In order to find those same outputs in this function, we have to move up three. We have to put in numbers that are three greater. We put in numbers that are three greater than the numbers you put into this one. Here we put in negative 2, we've got to move up 3 from there, we've got to put in 1 to get the same output. So if we look at the graph, <coughs> this x squared function has this shape right here. Right? It's all centralized right here. To get that same shape out of this function, uh, we have to move to the right 3. then we get these same exact uh, outputs. 1 to the right of the vertex, we get out 1. 2 to the right of the vertex, we get 4. 3 to the right of the vertex, we get 9. But because we're subtracting 3 off of every input, we have to put in x values that are 3 greater than if we were just using x squared. We have to use x values that are 3 greater. That's why our graph shifts over 3 to the right. 
that sound familiar to that absolute value? Function, right? We would subtract three, we would write three. With it was in the absolute value. If it's inside the square root, we subtract three from x. But, or inside the square, we subtract three before we square it, it's gonna move to the right three. It's a line of symmetry. It would normally, if we didn't have that multiply by 2, it would just go uh, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, 4, 16, 5, 25, and so on. Okay? But it's not 1, 1. It's 1 and 2 times 1. 1, comma 2. And it's not over 2, up 4. It's up over 2 and up 2 times 4, so up 8. We wouldn't go over 3 and up 9, we go over 3 and up 18, 2 times 9. Right? 2 times every output you would get just from x squared. Um, did I write that? I don't know. Oh, it's, I guess my circle made it look like a 3, 2. Alright, uh, sorry. All right, to the left, we go up two, not one, but two, twice as much, okay? If we go to the left, two from the vertex, we didn't go up four, we go up eight, twice as much as four. Let's move it twice as steep. We try to make it a nice curve at the bottom if possible. And if it moves uh, over h, okay, so we think of it as being minus h, right? We move to the right h, okay? Moves to the right h, including the vertex, right? The vertex would move over h, okay? And then it would move up to k. Right, this is the vertex we're talking about. This would be the vertex. The vertex would be, the, the coordinates of the vertex would be whatever h is, comma, whatever k is. Keep in mind though, h is being subtracted. It always has to be subtracted. If we're gonna use that rule, if we're gonna just say h, comma, k. So if we have x plus two, we'd have to write x minus negative two for that to work. So the, the, uh, the vertex would be x negative 2 for x. So for example, if we had y equals negative 3 fourths times x plus 2 squared minus 3, we could write this as x minus negative 2 squared minus 3 minus negative 2 is the same as plus 2. So 
the vertex is at negative 2, negative 3. There's the vertex. So we've done that. We've done that. It's moved down 3. It's moved to the left 2. And now it just needs to be upside down and 3 fourths as steep. So we go down. Instead of going over 1, down 1, we go over 1, down 3 fourths from the vertex. Instead of over 2 and getting out a, a negative 4 from there, going down 4, right, because 2 squared is 4, we would get uh, 2 squared is 4 times 3 fourths. That would just be down 3, 1, 2, 3. One, two, three. So we get this line of symmetry. We could reflect those points over the line of symmetry. This right here, the way it's written, is called vertex form. Vertex form, I think it's pretty nice. It's kind of like the mx plus b of the quadratics. Quadratics are these kinds of functions we've been using where we have an x squared in there. Those are quadratics. So this is a convenient form. It tells you exactly where the vertex is. It tells you exactly how steep to make it and whether to flip it. Uh, upside down. Just a few, a few different alterations to make, and we've drawn our graph. So we take something that's in vertex form, like, like that. We can take it from vertex form. something called standard form. Just by doing what the parentheses says. It says to square. What does it mean to square something? Right? 5 squared means 5 times 5. Multiply 5 by itself. Negative 3 squared means negative 3 times negative 3. Multiply negative 3 by itself. x plus 2 squared means x plus 2 times x plus 2 x plus 2 times itself. And if we distribute x to x, we get x squared. If we distribute x to 2, we get 2x. Distribute 2 to x, we get 2x again. If we distribute 2 to 2, we get 4. And still subtract 9, because this all came from there. x squared plus 4x, and 4 minus 9 is negative 5. There we go. Now it's in. Standard form. Standard form is where you have something times x squared plus something times x plus a constant. Every quadratic can be written this way. If it's written in vertex form, you can just multiply it together. You multiply those things together. Um, there's a, another form, to, uh, another way to write a quadratic equation, and that's in intercept form. Okay, we're going to come back to this. Right. So far, what we've really done, we've, we've looked at how to graph a, uh, a quadratic, graph a parabola when the equation is written in vertex form, when it shows us how much to shift it up and down, how much to shift it left and right, how steep to make it if it should be upside down. Let's also look intercept form. Okay. It's called intercept form because it's talking about x-intercepts. What's an x-intercept? Or along the parabola. Or across the x-axis. Okay. Now think about the shape these, these parabolas have, right? They're these like u-shapes. Think about that. How many x-intercepts could a parabola have? You could have two. You could have two just like that, right? There's one, and there's one. Is there any other possible number of x-intercepts you could have? No. One. How could I have one? If the vertex is right on the x-axis, there's one. 
Any other possibilities? Zero. How about, how can we have zero? If it's not touching it. If it's not touching it, if it's like up here, right? It'll never be down here and touch the next axis. So we could have two, one, or zero. So let's look at these, these, x, these x intercepts here. What do they all have in common if we look at their coordinates? What do they all have in common? Yeah. The y is zero. The y is zero. Zero for y, zero for y, zero for y. Whatever you're putting in for x, if you're at a y intercept or at an x intercept, whatever you're putting in for x, you're getting out zero for y. Okay. So here's an example of, of, uh, of intercept form. Remember, you get an x-intercept if you plug something in for x, and what do you get out for y? Zero. Zero. Can you take a stab at it? Maybe it is just a wild guess. A number we can plug in for x here that, in the end, will give us zero. If you don't know, just take a wild guess. What number might you plug in for x that would give you zero once you're done doing all the number crunching? Is there a number? Definitely is. Okay. Just throw a wild guess out there if you don't have a seven. seven. Okay, let's see what happens when we plug seven in for x. Seven minus three times seven plus two. Seven minus three is four. And seven plus two is nine. When we multiply those two things together, will we get zero? How do you know? How do you know, even if you didn't know your times tables that well, how do you know that this wouldn't come out to be zero? Okay. What do we what do we need? If it what if x was two If x was two, would it be zero? Let's see. Because what we have here is is ultimately two numbers multiplied together. So if x was two, or negative two. Negative two, negative two plus two is zero. Does it even matter what this turns out to be? No, because no, we're going to multiply it by 0. So one value of x is negative 2. What's another value of x that will give us a 0? 3. Positive 3. 3 minus 3 gives us 0. 0 times who cares is 0. OK? So these are our x-intercepts, negative 2 and 3. So there's our x-intercepts. Right. Parabolas, they have that nice line of what? Symmetry. Symmetry. Right. Line of symmetry. Where's the line of symmetry if these are the two x-intercepts? One. At one? Right here? Yep. Does that look symmetrical? Uh, no. And now we got two four. to the right here, three to the four. left. Five. Four. At half? Splits it right down the middle, right? One and a half, one or two and a half, two and a half. That's symmetrical. How do you find right in between two numbers? Like if we have the two x-intercepts, how are you going to find the number right between them? Right in the middle. Just the average of those two numbers. You have to find an average. Adam divided by two, right? So negative two plus three over 2, negative 2 plus 3 is 1, over 2, 1 half. Any x intercepts, just add those two x values together, divide by 2, you're going to find what's right between them. That's, that's exactly what we want, what's the average right between the two. Um, we could also take this guy right here. We can take this guy and write it in standard form. How would that go? How do we write that in standard form? When it started in vertex form, how do we write it in standard form? Distribute. Distribute. How are we going to write this in standard form? Just distribute. Just distribute it. x squared plus 2x. x squared plus 2x. Then we go to negative 3. Negative 3x minus 6. x squared uh, plus x minus 6. Standard form. 
Why is it plus x? Oh, sorry, minus x. Minus x minus six. So if an equation is given to us in standard form, then for the vertex, x, the x part of the vertex is equal to negative b over 2a. So if we were given the equation like x, x would be negative b over 2, what's b here? Negative 6. b is negative 6. b is always the one that's with x, the coefficient of x. So negative b, negative negative 6, over 2 times a, that's 3. Negative negative 6 is 6, 2 times 3 is 6. So the x part of the vertex is 1. How do we find the y part of the vertex? You just have you have x, so you plug it right back in there. That'll give you the y value of the vertex. 